Hey everyone, welcome back to IINS 2.0 here at stormwind.com. And as you are probably well aware, this is session number five. It's great to see all of our audience members in the studio audience on time here and ready and raring to go with our IINS class. Let's go ahead and jump right into the material. Lots to do today, lots of interesting and fun material in today's session. So let's get started. What we wanted to pick up with today was a look at IPv6. As we get more and more, you know, into the future, right? We have to worry about IPv6 more and more, the next generation of the IP or TCP IP protocol suite. So let's make sure that you have a good solid understanding of this new suite of protocols. And in fact, we can even do some demonstrations uh, quickly to make sure that you have that. Then what else we're gonna do is we're gonna turn our attention in session five to firewalling. Yeah, firewalling, very, very important, as you might guess, in a security class. I'll go through this initial IPv6 information fairly quickly, and the reason why I'm going to do that is you should have, hey, there's a chair in the way over there in the corner. Let me go ahead and fix that. So uh, I'll go through it quickly because you should have gotten this information from your CCNA training. Sure. All right. I got that chair out of the way. So let's go ahead and take a look at the address space in V6. Yeah, sure. You know that we are running out of V4 addresses. Even with the Band-Aid that is network address translation, we are running out of V4 addresses. Uh, the public addresses that we convert our private addresses to, we are just plain running out of those. So it is time to expand the address space and IPv6 expands the address space dramatically, doesn't it? from 32 bits to 128 bits, giving approximately 53 billion times a billion times a billion addresses per person on the planet. An astounding number of addresses available in the space. Why the need for this massive address space? Well, the need arises from, of course, the explosion in the usage of addresses. You know, ebook readers, TV, cable set boxes, photo cameras, billions of home and industrial appliances, automobiles that are going to want IP addresses, mobile users with smartphones, and the internet population itself, the way it's exploding. We obviously need a larger address space, and IPv6 comes to the rescue. Now, what is interesting too about this is the fact that. There were some technologies that were built uh, to enhance IPv4, and the engineers of IPv6 said, yeah, no, forget this optional enhancement kind of approach. We are going to build these features right in to the IPv6 protocol. So we're gonna build security with IPsec right in. It's mandatory. We're gonna make sure that mobile IP uh, works better than ever and is more integrated in the protocol. We're going to make sure that we don't need band-aids like network address translation. We're going to make sure that we just don't need that whole concept of private addresses being translated into public addresses. Now you might think, well, wait a minute now, network address translation gives me these great security benefits because I hide the internal addressing from a would-be attacker. Well, sure, that's a slight security benefit, but understand that NAT, network address translation, breaks the fundamental paradigm of the internet, which is there should be a unique source address communicating with a unique destination address. And when you have these unique communications like this, 
this unique address communicating with another unique address, you can build in all kinds of sophisticated security mechanisms for that communication. So having that true end-to-end -end paradigm in the internet with unique addressing, in my opinion, is going to far outweigh the address hiding, the simple address hiding that we can have with network address translation. So let's talk features and enhancements that are available. We've mentioned some, obviously the larger address space, the mobility, the security, but something that I want to emphasize here and uh, I'm going to elaborate on with you is a simplified header and transition richness. Yeah, they did a really brilliant thing in IPv6. They said, you know, we recognize so many inefficiencies in routing with the IPv4 header that can be of variable length. They said we can make things much more efficient if we go ahead and we make a fixed size IPv6 header. And that's exactly what they did. But you look at this and you say, well, wait a minute now, how is that possible? Because if we're going to do a bunch of sophisticated options, okay, if we're going to do a bunch of sophisticated options here with the IPv6 header, then how can it be of a fixed size? Well, what they did was they came up with this concept of extension headers. Yeah, so clever. We have a fixed size initial, or as say, stated here, basic IPv6 header. And then we have these additional, as many as we need, extension headers beyond that. Yeah, pretty cool. There's a next header pointer in here that says, okay, there's an extension header, go to that. And then these extension headers can stack up. So a nice fixed size header for the basic stuff and then optional extension headers when we want to do additional fancy things with the protocol. Now something else for an enhancement that you've probably heard about is stateless auto configuration. Pretty cool. You may have heard that, oh, in IPv6, there's no longer a need for DHCP. Well, that's kind of true. We still have DHCP and IPv6 for various implementation cases, but if you wanted to go without it, you could. Look at this situation. The host comes up. In fact, let me highlight this for you, these steps. The host comes up and says, uh-oh, I don't have a prefix. I have no idea what network I'm supposed to be participating in. The router hears this solicitation request, the local router, okay, the IPv6 router, and says, hey, no problem. Here's a router advertisement, and it's got the prefix, the network prefix you're supposed to use. I've got a nice default route for you and whatever other parameters you're going to need. The host then says, wow, thank you very much for my prefix, and I'll go ahead and calculate my uh, host portion. Wow. You see, in IPv6, we have a 64-bit prefix for the network, and we have a 64-bit prefix for the identifier of a host. And that 64-bit host prefix can be automatically generated by the host. So the router just has to worry about giving the prefix out there to the host, and the host can go ahead and take care of the rest. The host can say, all right, I'm fully aware of how to configure my own 64-bit host portion. Really, really cool. Something else that I want you to be aware of when it comes to IPv6 is the fact that we are going to have a dramatic, dramatic increase on the reliance of 
ICMP. Yeah, in, I, in version 4, we used ICMP for things like basic connectivity checking with ping, informational and error messaging, the need uh, notification of fragmentation. But notice in IPv6, it takes on a much larger role, helping with address assignments, address resolution, the discovery of routers, multicast group management, mobile IPv6. So ICMP takes on a much larger role in the version 6 world. Now, one of the things that we obviously need is we need what we call transition richness. We cannot have a situation in which we send out a memo that says, hey, the internet's being turned off next Tuesday night because we need to migrate over to V6. So there has to be remarkably robust transition richness. This needs to seamlessly coexist with the IPv4 protocol, and that's exactly what we have systems capable of doing now. You see, all of our devices now, all of our network devices that are being created now are what are called dual stack. What does dual stack mean? It means IPv6 sits right next to IPv4 on all the interfaces and we can tunnel V6 in V4 packets because let's face it, what we're going to have is we're going to have islands of IPv6 and these islands of IPv6 are going to need to be connected by IPv4. So we're going to have the tunneling of the V6 packets into V4 packets so they can be safely carried through the V4 environments. What's really interesting about this is the fact that in our lifetimes, we will not see the elimination of V4 completely. Yeah, it's highly unlikely that we'll see all of the V4 gone away because of the great transition richness that we have between the two protocols. So we'll have more and more islands of IPv6 that we can easily connect thanks to the tunneling mechanisms and many, many different transition mechanisms or transition techniques that we can utilize. So here's a great, great comparison chart for you. And I'll just highlight a couple of things that I want you to know in this particular class. Obviously, everyone knows about the increased address space, but something for this particular class that I really want to point out is the fact that IP security, something that we'll be talking about in detail in this particular course, IP security dramatically uh, expands for V6 and it is mandatory. It's mandatory. And it's easily going to work end to end because we do away with network address translation issues. So IP6, uh, IP security is mandated and it works beautifully end to end. Something else that I want you to remember here is that ICMP has that dramatically expanded role as we pointed out. Now, what about the addressing? Let's see the addressing at work. Obviously, you need to intimately understand the addressing if you're thinking about, you know, security with this particular protocol in any type of capacity. So we need to really understand the addressing that is at work in IPv6.